think adventure is a choice. The phone rang, and it was late at night. And it was a voice on the other end I didn't recognize. And he identified himself, and I realized I kind of knew him. He was, when I got to the bottom of what he was calling about, he was offering me a job. The job paid $600 a month, but it gets better. It was a package deal. They wanted both of us. They wanted my wife and me. So it was $1,200 a month, plus room and board. The call came at a great time. I'd been married for less than six months. It was November. Construction work was done for the year. I was unemployed. She was in college. So, without much discussion with her, I said yes. A little over a month later, on the first day of January, <coughs> we left on this adventure. I had a, a pickup truck with everything we owned in the back. I had a box of my mother's homemade Christmas cookies I had enough gas to drive 4,000 miles. I had enough gas money to drive 4,000 miles. And I had a passenger who could not stop crying. <laughs> Seven days later, 4,000 miles later, mid-afternoon, about 100 miles south of the Arctic Circle, in January, we arrived. It was already dark, and it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We pulled in, we met our new employer, and we started to work the next day. We were house parents for eight teenagers. Never mind that we were not yet to our 22nd birthday. And our oldest teenager was 16. We were parents. Never mind that the state of Alaska had decided that none of the eight were parentable, and so they had removed them from homes. A lot like some of the kids who come and go in and out of our schools through the foster system, our kids were mad at almost everything. We learned to ice fish together. We learned to make beds. We learned to do dishes. We learned to celebrate birthdays. We learned that anger from them was not at us. We learned how to reward positive and negative behavior with the same affect. That adventure was pivotal in everything else I've done in my life. A few years later, in 2008, after a carpentry work and college and high school teaching and high school coaching and school and district administration, I became the superintendent in Shelby County Public Schools. The board established three goals. I still have those goals in a file drawer. If you know where my office is and you know the bottom left-hand drawer that I often reach to, there's a board file in there that has the notes from my very first evaluation meeting with the board, in which Sam Hinkle gave me these three goals. 90% proficiency on state tests close all achievement gaps, and operate on a balanced budget. Some of you were here at that time, and you know that we were at the 29th percentile in state testing at that time. What we started doing that first year 
was visiting classrooms a ton. We were in classrooms a lot. Carrie Fannin was in the lead. We had a lot of other people involved in that. Ms. Wisman was a part of that team. We were in classrooms a lot with principals. And what we concluded after several months was that we had some quality issues. Rigor was not where we wanted it to be. We talked about rigor, relevance, and relationships, if you remember those terms. We decided we were teaching to the middle an awful lot. And we were saying things like one size doesn't fit all. We weren't using words like personalized learning, but we were talking about things like differentiation. We decided that we needed some help. And we knew that our neighbors next door in Oldham County were doing some work with the Public Education and Business Coalition. And we decided it was time for us to learn more about that work. So our first group went to Denver. Lori was a part of that group. Jennifer here, Jennifer's not here. Jennifer was a part of that group. Um, we began to see what this was all about. And the thinking strategies became a big part of our push. Um, so, because you all know my corny sense of humor, uh, we worked on our core for five years. At the end of that five year period, here's where we were. We were at the 79th percentile amongst Kentucky schools. And those of you who were a part of that, remember what a big deal that was. We had banners at every school in the district. We told everybody about our number. We were not at 90% proficiency on state scores, but we were well above where we had been. The second one in yellow was the problem. We had bigger gaps than when we started. This is state data, and our data mirrored this. If you can't read the letters, or the, the words, black students, white students, black students, white students, black students, white students, black students, white students, through a four year period tracking a group of kids. Every gap we had, was like that. So when I came to Shelby County, my um, my journey had started back in 2000, where I met Artavia Acklin at a Kentucky Reading Project session where we learned about strategies that work, which was the seminal book around thinking strategies. And that was my first connection with Shelby County. And in 2013, I came to Shelby County to really, uh, with the focus and, um, and intentionality around building lab classrooms so that we could spread the understanding around workshop and thinking strategies. And as I think about that today, I think about how the thinking strategies really has moved our students to have agency and understand not only content, but understand themselves as learners. And I think about our deepening understanding around workshop and how it's not just that time structure, but it's a ritual and routine around a learning community and how formative assessment throughout empowers students to learn. As I think about the PEDC continuum, and as I even look at the Danielson framework in the exemplary column, I see what lab hosts achieve when they work on intentionality around workshop and thinking strategies. One of the other things that happened around that time is that we dedicated a role group to working on that work with teachers. And we not only developed internal capacity through instructional coaching matched with lab hosts, but we also reached outward to PEBC and OVEC to, um, to really build a symbiotic relationship 
where we were working outward and building capacity inward. And we followed that a lot, we followed that pattern a lot throughout this story. So this thinking continued and we spread and brought people in to our district and not only helped our own grow, but we helped people throughout the region grow as they used our classrooms and then eventually Franklin County classrooms also as model classrooms to really deeply understand thinking strategies and workshop. As we headed into developing the mission statement. 2013 was a big year of rethinking who we were as a district. The mission that came out of that work came out of this thinking through a triangle. There was a book that we used um, in the district some. We didn't book study it. Some of you may have seen it or remember it by Henderson and Gornick about curricular wisdom. And uh, it showed this idea that put wisdom at the center of your triangle and then the big three pieces. These aren't the words that came out of the book, but these are the words that came out of us. We wanted mastery of standards. We want, wanted that at the very top. That still mattered a lot to us. But we wanted these other two pieces. One of the things that uh, we would do during that time period was tell stories about our kids, kids who had great scores, but weren't great examples. Kids who had great scores who were selfish. Kids who had great scores and were dishonest. Those sort of stories would come to our <coughs> minds. And we talked about our imperative, our moral responsibility to teach for curricular wisdom at the center and not just mastery of standards. We entered this strategic planning cycle through 2014. We talked about these three questions. Where are we now? Where do we want to be? How will we get there? We talked about current state and desired state. So strategic planning became something that mattered a lot to us during that time period. We started talking then in 2014 about this idea of personalized learning. What does this mean? And these areas around personalized learning were the pieces we were talking about at that time. We, we were trying to figure out what we, what we wanted to put in this personalized learning idea. Monica Martinez, her book came out, Deeper Learning. We talked about that book and looked at the school districts she visited. Some of the districts we visited across the years, Lindsay Unified, for example, we heard about it in Monica's book in 2014. We knew we wanted these pieces. I remember a lot of the talk about mentorship, about helping kids understand their responsibility to others by intentionally putting kids in situations where they have that mentor interaction and relationship with each other. Goal setting was really important during that time period. One of the reasons goal setting emerged as a big piece for us is because we were doing so much academic goal setting at that time. We were constantly having kids goal set with math. That's the first real goal setting thing we did district wide was with math. Self direction was important. Before we talked about everyone having a personalized learning plan, we were, we were already talking about self, self direction, just not quite understanding how that might go together. Looking back at that first strategic plan from 2014 to 2018, these are five big mileposts that impact what we're able to do today that came out of that first strategic plan. This idea of working with a digital learning management system, it became important to us. We've cycled through a couple. We're on our third one now, trying to figure out how to get the strongest tool we can get. Scaling one-to-one -one with Chromebooks, shifting to standards-based grading, K through 12. That was a big piece of the plan. We set out to double the career and tech ed opportunities in the district. When, 
when we think about that, that one doesn't get talked about a lot. But that was because we wanted kids to have the opportunity to leave to learn. That was really important to us. I'm hearing a lot of talk about that even today, not just in the CTE world. We're hearing it regularly. I heard it yesterday with my student advisory group, our big picture students, talking about the importance of leaving to learn and what they learned through that experience. And demonstrating mastery through culminating projects. We started that work calling them culminating projects. We all know what it's evolving to now, but at that first plan, we were talking about culminating projects. So during that time, um, I had come to the district in 2010. So I was at the beginning of workshop model and thinking strategies. Um, and during that time, I, during this time, like 2013 and 2014, the time we had written our um, new strategic plan, I was principal at East Middle, and most of you probably know that. Um, and the work was hard and the work was real. I tell Dr. Nahoff jokingly, the struggle was real. <laughs> she also um, tells me how much fun it was to work with. Yeah, <laughs> that too. <laughs> um, but it, it was hard work. So part of our work was figuring out, as leaders, was figuring out how we make this happen in our schools. And Lori was my counterpart across town at that time, and we were trying to figure out how to make this work happen. And so we started visiting places. Uh, we went to Mooresville to visit and learn about how they rolled out and implemented technology for one-to-one -one devices. We went to Wisconsin on a bumpy plane ride to visit in a day, 24 hours, to do the Institute for Personalized Learning, um, which we've now sent teachers and other, a lot of you've been back up there to see that same work. Um, we sent some high school folks out to uh, in Innovations High to visit those schools to see what personal learning was there. So that was work that was going on in leadership, and we were all trying to figure out how to make it work in our buildings. So at East, um, we began to talk about where we wanted to start. And at the time, we were working with Avery, looking at our intervention structures um, and figuring out how to make those better. And we realized that there was a um, disconnect between behaviors and grades and overall achievements. We were studying all of that, and we realized there was inconsistency across the building, and we didn't know really what kids knew. At the same time, Shelby County High School was leading the way in the district with standards-based grading work. So my staff decided that we needed to move in that direction because we believed that everybody needed to master the standards. It was, a, it was what every kid needed, and that was kind of where I, Dr. Knopf would always say, plant your flag. Our flag was every kid deserved the same opportunity to master every standard. So um, we dug in with Tom Gusky. We went to a couple of his workshops. We I partnered with Lori. We brought him in to talk to our middle school teams. We redesigned and wrote a purpose statement and figured out how to start trying to report standards-based grading and do mastery learning work. And what we learned at the time we were doing this was workshop model was pivotal in that. And knowing how to use that workshop model to grow assessment and get that data to get to mastery learning. But it was hard. It was hard work with teachers. It was hard work with parents. The pushback was hard sometimes. But the resiliency of the teachers during that work was incredible. Um, we made it work. We rethought things a couple of times. Um, worked with the high school. We wrote policy, went back to the drawing board. It was tough work, but it all pivoted, was pivot, not the right word. Um, it all hinged on the success of workshop model because that's how you have to get to mastery learning. While we were figuring that out, they moved up the timeline for Chromebooks. <laughs> so middle school got them in January, um, which threw another piece of learning into the curve. So we started talking about SAMR model. Immediately, it was a struggle with um, the kids and how to manage it, and then how not to use it just for substitution, but to get to deeper learning. So we began to think about our schedule to make that happen, and that we came up with this, quote, innovative schedule, which really was an innovative schedule. We changed, at the time, we changed um, our structure on Monday through Thursday, and Friday had a whole different look um, where we changed up the number of periods in a day and how we did related arts, but it was innovative. And the teachers were all into that work. But we had to continually go back and visit workshop because as we were making these adjustments, we would forget that workshop is the pivotal thing. So that's where we circle back in our ecosystem all the time. But the work was hard, but I can 
as I look across the district, that work has grown across the district with the leaders in this built in this room. And that's what's been so pivotal about the work, which gets us back to <laughs> our why. Part of our why was about this mission. Why students who master standards lead by example and embrace social responsibility. So um, the second part of this, which I didn't talk about, was we also introduced PBL work during that time period um, and sending folks out to that training so we could start the social responsibility and the culminating projects. So this is when we started this terminology, 3PT. Um, Ms. Wisman took a group of teachers from Shelby County High to Innovations High School in Salt Lake City. So I get a phone call mid-afternoon for me. It's early evening for her. She's in Salt Lake City. She has spent the day at the school with her teacher group. She's talking really fast like she does when she gets excited. And she's saying, I want to do da 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 No, I think it was we. We want to do da 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 I need to make sure that you're going to be behind me if I do that. Because we're getting ready to plan it tonight. <laughs> and it, 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 was, it was one of those moments that to me, it, it was like, translate, I have a plan, I need you to stay out of my way. And uh, it, it was a really great moment for me. And when I think back to that, that is an example that if I ever write a book about this, that I would put in the book, when, te when principles get to that place, that's when the most impactful things happen. Because the calls don't come anymore, tell me what to do next. The calls are, I need you to help me have, get this. I need you to help me do this. That's a totally different perspective on owning the vision, owning the direction, and owning the course of things. And uh, I would say that in my work with Ms. Wisman as a principal, it has all been that way since that night, since that phone call. Every bit of it's been about her vision, where she wants to go, what she wants to do, and my role in supporting that. So this idea of path, place, path, and time, started in our district with the Swissman and the Shelby County High group visiting Innovations High School. This terminology spread through the district. We talked about 3PT quite a bit. Both high schools created uh, something that was in this model. And uh, we, we took off. The idea was it was kind of in isolation. They were all somewhat of a pilot program with the idea that it would scale school-wide. I think one of the things that I need to say at this point in the conversation is I think you've probably seen a pattern that we kept circling back to workshop through the years. We're still circling back to workshop. This year, with a lot of new hiring, one of the things many of you said to me last spring and into the summer was, next, next year has to be a workshop. Lori is really digging in as hard with workshop with her team right now as she ever has in all of her years as a principal. Shannon came to us from Oldham County. One of the reasons she rose to the top in the selection process, in addition to the fact that she eats Reese cups all the time, was that she is so entrenched in teaching and coaching in the workshop model. And that's such a good fit for us. I'm seeing that all over the district, and uh, that's just part of our DNA. We circle back. That's where quality instruction lives for us. So uh, it, during the first strategic leadership plan, I was the curriculum coordinator. And um, when we got toward the end of that, about 2016, uh, we started to, uh, if you remember, if you were a part of our team at that point, in that first plan, we brought together um, all of the teachers across the district at every grade level. And we did a backwards planning about what it looked like to be college and career ready. 
And so we went, we started with 12th grade. What do 12th graders need to be able to be college ready? We, we started with college ready. And then we did, we brought the 11th grade to all the way down to kindergarten. And we came up with benchmarks so we could say, okay, if they can do this in third grade, they're on track. But when we looked at it, and we started to see what was happening with that, every indicator was a score. It was a MAP score, it was a K prep score, it was an ACT score, a DRA score, everything was a score. And uh, what we were saying by doing that was that if they get the right score, they're going to be fine. And we knew that that wasn't true. It didn't meet our mission statement. So at this point in time is when we started to think about it toward the end um, of that first plan of developing our profile of a graduate, which we have now. And we started exhibitions, started to talk, talk about doing and, and showing and doing things a little bit differently. Uh, also at that time, we were part of the UK Center for Next Generation Leadership Academy. But at that time, Carmen Col Coleman was at UK and she came to meet with us. And she inter introduced us to a book. Can you fix this? Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she introduced us to the book Transforming Schools and um, because she knew we were working on our grad profile. So we started to, to read the book and learn about uh, envisioned schools in California. And what we were in, if you remember, we were in the unified technology, really tight room admin team. And um, at the break, Maura and I were talking and I said, you know what? We need to talk to these people. Let's try to find them. So we were uh, stalking them on all social media and all of those things. And we finally found, um, reached out to Justin Wells. And we talked to him out in that lobby that day on the phone. And that's what started our partnership with um, Alcine and the years that we've, we've worked with her and still continue to partner with her. At the same time, we were also a member of Ed Leader 21, so some of you will see your pictures up there from uh, this past summer when we went up there to present. Uh, but that also became a great network for us to, to talk to like-minded people. Because as you know, sometimes it gets lonely in this work in Kentucky. Um, it's starting to spread, but right now uh, we needed those national partners and people who uh, think like us and want the same kinds of things for, uh, for their kids. Again, um, as we started to move forward, we always kept that same mission of preparing wise students who master standards, lead by example, and embrace social responsibility. And that is what our profile of a graduate was built on. So by this time, we had moved from hearing teachers in 2013-14 saying things like, I'm not a lab host, I'm not a thinking strategies classroom, to saying workshop is the instructional delivery model in Shelby County. And we were seeing the benefits of that as teachers grew in proficiency in um, running workshop in their classroom, they were closing gaps. We had data that, that said that. We were still sending people to uh, the Personalized Learning Institute. Um, we were sending teachers there, so they were coming back and trying things in their own classrooms. We sent leaders to the Envision schools to look at defenses. We sent leaders to the Lindsay Unified District to look at how workshop and digital learning systems work together. And we were continuing to have all of these partnerships with others while we ran pilots or had small groups of people working on different things within. The challenge for teachers was, okay, I'm holding this big thing called workshop, I'm trying to figure that out, and I'm learning about PBL, does that fit? Do I throw this out, do I throw that out? But how does blended learning work with workshop? So teachers had to be really resilient to figure out how to integrate and really understand how all of these things synthesize together. Part of the thing that we realized about this time too was that we had a strategic plan. Some of the leaders knew the strategic plan. They were going and seeing, and teachers were going places and doing things, but when we said strategic plan, teachers were like, what? What is that? So that, that thing that existed at that point on a 
um, Excel spreadsheet with words across columns, teachers weren't really clear about. So we knew that going forward, one thing we needed to do, because we knew we were getting ready to push into even harder, more challenging work, we needed to be really transparent with all of our stakeholders about the plan, and we needed to really ramp up communication. So now it was time for the next strategic planning process. Um, so um, we had a profile of a graduate built, and we knew that we had to have a plan to get there. Because we all believe all the parts, everybody believes this, the profile of a graduate, that that's what we want for graduates. But we have to be intentional about getting kids there, because it just doesn't happen um, by just showing up every day. So at the same time, if you all remember, uh, Dr. Nyhoff was in a competency-based program at Northern Kentucky University getting his doctorate. And so he was starting to learn about competency-based education, and the rest of us were like, what are you talking about, if you remember? And um, so he kind of got some of the um, district administrators going and reading and thinking. And then if you remember the day, I'll never forget this day, we had Lee and Learn at Central Office. And we had this really cool idea for the principals that we were gonna do this station work, and you were gonna rotate through these stations and know all about competency-based education by the end of the day. Some of you were out on the front steps and some of you were all around and by the end of the day, you all at like, Susan, what in the world are we doing? <laughs> um, so um, we were, I always when I talk to other people about our, our first uh, learning about competency-based based education, I would say, well, Dr. Nyhoff was here. The student achievement team was here. The principals were here, and it just took some time to catch up with that. So I feel like uh, now uh, we are catching up with him. I don't know that we'll ever catch him, but we're catching up. We're uh, making a, uh, a run for our money. So um, in, the, in that time period is when we created our current strategic leadership plan. And uh, the part that I want to focus on is the personalized learning part. And the part about, um, we know that we want uh, kids to demonstrate and defend competencies. That's a huge part of that. That's, that's uh, the what of that. But the reason, the why behind that goes back to our mission statement. That it's demand and guarantee equity for all. And equity right now, as you know, is thrown around all over the place in education. And equity means lots of things <coughs> to lots of people. But what we believe in, in Shelby County is that... <coughs> All kids deserve equitable opportunities. Doesn't mean equal, doesn't always mean fair or whatever it means that we all, they all have the same opportunities to master standards. They may get there in different ways um, and that's where, where our work really is right now. You'll see some of your kiddos up there uh, in the pictures um, as well. So when we started thinking about um, that um, in the ecosystem that we were in, when we reflect back on all that we had done in that first plan, um, what we were really doing is we were trying these new things, 3PT, some scheduling, some Chromebooks, all of these new learning things we were doing, standards-based grading, but we were able to fit those into a more traditional 175-day schedule, and it didn't disrupt a lot. It was pretty, still pretty balanced. Uh, you know, we weren't messing with things too much, but now we are. And that's why we're feeling like we're feeling. We are disrupting the ecosystem. We're doing school differently than it's been done um, for the past hundred years. Um, so that's why we get uh, a lot of feedback from our stakeholders and our parents and our community and other people asking questions about what are you doing and why are you doing it, why we have to defend ourselves uh, more often about the why. Um, so uh, just know that this disruption has started um, and because our plan is really based upon becoming a competency-based district, which is based on advancing on mastery and uh, demonstrating that mastery through defenses, that that disruption is going to continue. We're going we're gonna to keep feeling uncomfortable, but it's, it's for the right reasons. Um, so when you're feeling that way, um, just know that we're all in this together. And luckily, other people are getting there too. So um, in 2018, Kentucky 
uh, formed a consortium. At that point, it was a pilot. Trigg County and Shelby County were the leads in that uh, with KDE. And we started to think about um, profiles and anchor competencies and what that looks like, continued to work with Alcine and those kinds of things. Then the following year, they added districts. So right now, there are 10 districts in Kentucky in the consortium, all at different places. Um, we are out ahead of that group, uh, but we, we are helping build that guiding coalition. Uh, so it won't be just us. Uh, doing the work that will have a larger group uh, with us moving forward. So, as you know, um, for this plan, my job is curriculum personalization, right? So, a lot of those top bullets is falls under under my work, under our work that I lead and try to use teacher leaders to help. So, one of the things that um, one of the first things that Susan charged me with when we transitioned into this plan and I transitioned into this role was to develop a curriculum. We needed a curriculum. And our belief was, in that equity piece, was that every teacher needed to be able to access that curriculum. Because if we wanted to close gaps, it didn't matter if we wanted to move when, when mastery happened, it didn't matter what grade they were in. But we needed to have a tool that allowed for that to happen to support teacher work in that. So, as you know, we now have our curriculum website that we've developed, and on that website, um, you have curriculum for your course right now, and that happened with the support of our coaches. Um, <laughs> they loved the three months that I sequestered them in a classroom and where we wrote our first set of ELA and math curriculum work. Um, it's actually known as the Curriculum Dungeon, in case you gotten that term. Um, but the tool and resource that they produced from ELA and math was phenomenal. And I would I would put it up against and when I show districts that come visit us, I pull up our website and talk about how we use that curriculum and show them the document. They are amazed um, at the work that was into that document and how well it's aligned and, and the resources and information it provides teachers. But it was it's pivotal because if we're going to move when ready and we're going to close gaps, then we have to have that accessible for every teacher regardless of their grade level. So that's a big chunk of my work. Um, the other part of my work then is how do we assess that? So we, we also realized as we moved into this work what, that we needed a way to calibrate and understand what mastery of standards really looked like. So we also dug into mastery skills and developed mastery skills, which have been very beneficial we're still calibrating around, but that work is beginning to become visible in a conversation that, that we've had with CCE and some of the calibration work we've done with them. But we also needed a way to talk about our profile. So that became a big part of my work. If we're going to move to defense and want kids to understand the profile and teachers to understand how to teach the profile, there has to be intentional planning and tools. So we've developed our first set of single point rubrics, as you know, that are on the website as well, that help assess that work and those were all developed with teacher voice um, and partnerships with with uh, vision learning partners and Alcine. Um, I pulled a group of teachers together and asked them to start like what is it it looks like at your grade level what uh, for each of these indicators they came to several meetings after school with me and gave me input we created our first set of tools Alcine gave me a little feedback on those tools um, and then the next set the next three were better, and then over the summer, I pulled together and invited teachers, and they revised those tools into what you have today. So teachers also have been involved with this from the get-go in terms of the profile, and then they give feedback on the mastery skills every day. Um, those two tools are important work in Empower. Um, those are how we figure out what the learning progressions are and how we give kids feedback. And Empower is a tool that's caused a little bit of disruption. Um, and we're still learning that tool. But it is a true mastering learning standards-based rating tool that these assessment tools are critical for. Um, and these assessment tools are also critical inside of the workshop model. Again, I'm over on. Which gets us to our work with Pride and, and Jonathan. So when we were doing this work and beginning to move into this plan of defense, we began to think about 
what pieces do we have in place and how do we shift to the true competency-based model? I don't remember where or who found this book, but I remember reading it. <laughs> and then the same kind of conversation happened. Why don't we just reach out and see if they'll come help us? So again, Susan or Laura, one of them, sent an email to one or both of them and we're like, hey, we're doing this work. And now we have this fabulous partnership that is helping us understand how to use those assessment tools to design assessments, change our PLC structures, and begin to move forward into our competency education vision. So we not only were reaching out to people who have gone on the journey before, but we were also going to convenings and uh, institutes like the INAC Hall, which is now the Aurora Institute. This is a picture of a bunch of us who got to go to Nashville. Um, and we saw a lot of our partners there. Alcine was there, Brian and John were there, Justin was there. So all of the people in our work, we were with our people. Um, we even did an, an exhibition, Dr. Nyhoff and some folks from The Rock were able to exhibit in the exhibit hall about some of the work that they were doing. So we were um, shoulder to shoulder with, with some of our learning partners that we had and were introduced to another group called Assessment for Learning Project who are um, connected to the Center for Innovation and Education out of the University of Kentucky. And a group of us went in and sat down in their session and it was like being home. We wanted to kick our shoes off, circle up, sing Kumbaya because they were doing the work that we were doing. People from Two Rivers in Virginia all the way to Hawaii were talking about doing what we were doing. And it was um, a very affirming uh, session. And at the end, they said, and we are giving micro grants. And we said, us, we, we will do that. And that's how we got connected to the Center for Collaborative Education. Because as a partner of the Assessment for Learning, they, um, they help with performance assessments. And at that time, we were talking about our kids doing, and we needed to know how to assess what they were doing in a different way other than pencil, pencil paper. This is um, the butcher paper that we created when we were there, um, and it shows our journey. It's messy, but you see circling back and interconnectedness and moving forward. And that anchor helped us to think about how we are really um, constantly circling back, but yet moving forward through partnerships. You know the story of QPA this summer. Again, that pattern of have a group of people from every school learn this and then spread it. We were really excited with plans that each of you made to scale and spread in your schools. And then we had another disruption. We, we were learning a tool to manage mastery learning that wasn't a pilot. Everyone was doing it, all stakeholders knew it, and it was a change. So that kind of put a kibosh on some of the QPA work, but we saw some, um, some growth in it as we calibrated. So that continual idea of, of bringing things back, reaching out to others, bringing things back. Our newest partners in, with two revolutions in Southern New Hampshire University have a CBE program cohort with several of you, principals, instructional coaches. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. hand. If you're Let's in that cohort. Else. The rest of you look around at how many people are in that group. And these people are doing a competency-based master's program, coursework and master's program that helps move the strategic plan forward. The work they're doing is the work that needs to be done to move us forward. On a um, August night in Alaska, about 11 o'clock at night when the sun was still out, I got in that little blue car. It was a 1974 Honda Civic with 350,000 miles on it. And I headed back down the Alaska Highway. Lots of people ask me how I fit in, but I did. <laughs> I drove all night, and I drove all the next day. That second night, I stopped to sleep, got up the following morning, drove all day on a Monday, all night on a Monday night, 
And on Tuesday morning, as the sun came up, I crossed the Sherman Minton Bridge, and I was home. Lots of adventures happened since then. And I hope there are lots of adventures still yet to happen. There are a lot of adventures ahead of you all. And today, what we want to accomplish is for you all to be clear on planning and talking about that story. Your adventure that's behind and your adventure that's ahead as leaders in competency-based education. Thanks for listening to the story. <laughs>